Hi everyone, I'm Britt Hovland, and I did my practicum at the Ministry of Health, the Population and Public Health Division, and the Health Protection Branch. So my area was within food safety, and specifically uh, the Federal Provincial Territorial Food Safety Committee, and my topic of interest was enhancing collaborative governance. So a uh, little agenda for 10 minutes, just going to walk you through a really brief introduction to food safety in Canada, um, a little bit about the Food Safety Committee, take us through a definition of collaborative governance, look at the methods analysis and recommendations from the report that I developed, and some of the strengths and challenges for public health practice. So just a quick note that food safety is different than food security, so food security would be uh, equal or equitable access to the food um, based on people's uh, nutritional needs and making sure that they have equal access to food. And food safety is, is about making sure that the food people are consuming is safe. And it's quite a diverse um, and complex sector within food safety. This sort of gives you a snapshot of responsibilities. So uh, the federal government certainly has the greatest amount of um, jurisdictional authority and responsibility. And within the federal government, you've got the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And they are really the monitoring and um, enforcement body. Health Canada sets guidelines, um, develops national food policy and nutritional standards. And so the Canadian Food Inspection Agency regulates, makes sure that, that industry is following that. And then you have the Public Health Agency of Canada who's getting involved in surveillance and monitoring. So for example, when you have an outbreak, um, whether it's within a province or across Canada, F Public Health Agency of Canada is gonna be getting involved. The provinces and territories also have jurisdictional authority and develop legislation based on food that's produced and sold within provinces. Municipalities also have um, the right to um, uh, develop policies around food safety. And then the industry, they need to be following through with what Health Canada sets out in terms of their standards and guidelines um, and, and as well. Um, responding to concerns from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. And then there's the consumer who, you know, the individual that goes into the grocery store and purchases um, a container of milk and, and needs to read the label on it and um, the, you know, the date that says, you know, expires by. I mean, the consumer has a role to play as well. So that's a snapshot of responsibilities. Uh, the Food Safety Committee uh, stems from, in, for example, in most areas of public health when there's uh, a big issue or, or concern that unfolds. And back in 2008, there was a listeriosis outbreak and a lot of um, initiatives stemmed from that. And so the FPT Food Safety Committee would be one of them. The main goals of the committee is to coordinate the development of national food safety policy options, to implement initiatives to achieve national food safety, goal, uh, food safety goals and priorities, and of course, to do what they can to enhance accountability um, so that Canadians feel safe about their food. This is a, a chart that I developed in, in communication with the Food Safety Committee. Um, you can see that it's a, it's a large committee. You've got the federal um, agencies that involved Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, Health Canada, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. They all need to work together. And then you also have representation from all of the provinces and territories. And just to add another layer to that, you have health and typically agriculture sitting at the table as well. Um, the only exception would be Quebec, Nova Scotia, and none of it. So, you know, it's a, um, it's a large committee, it's quite complex in that way, and my role was to really look at how I could support the group in working more collaboratively. Uh, so the project focus um, was to support the uh, Federal Provincial Territorial Food Safety Committee's strategic objective to strengthen FPT integration and collaboration for informed food safety decision making and effective program delivery. How can this committee work really well together and how can they start um, collaborating across sectors? So my report question is, what are the main elements of collaborative governance theoretical frameworks that support the FTP Food Safety Committee's objectives to improve intergovernmental communication, so communication between all layers of government at the federal, provincial, and territorial level, and of course, cross-sector collaboration? 
So let's look at a different definition of collaborative governance. This one is from Emerson, Nabachi, and Balog, which is um, one of the studies that I focused on. The processes and structures of public policy decision making and management that engage people constructively across the boundaries of public agencies, levels of government, and or the public, private, and civic spheres. And this is the important part, to carry out a public purpose that could not otherwise be accomplished. So that's really key in understanding why groups need to work together um, to create that, that outcome that couldn't be accomplished just you know, on your own as one public agency. So my methods, you know, I access several databases, lots of search terms related to this, and probably like many of you, I had an amazing support through the UVic library. Um, uh, search terms, collaborative governance, interagency collaboration, cross-sector partnerships, lots of different ways uh, and terms to frame this. My method, so I did have criteria for what, which reports I included um, in this report. So the topic and its relevance to the research under investigation, the study's ability to present a multi-level systems framework of collaborative governance, and or the study's ability to provide a structured, systematic approach to creating the ideal conditions for cross-sector collaboration. So from that, I did focus on four main reports and four different uh, collaborative governance frameworks, and I pulled out some themes. Number one being that collaborations are very complex, and I think that's often why we want to hear about the success stories, because we hear often about the failures, but what makes them successful? It's the how and the what of success. Um, formally organized systems lay the foundation for collaboration. So it's that back, you know, that backbone organization and that structure that's going to help carry the collaborative effort, um, collaborative process through, and make it and help to make it successful. And that might look like um, having access to technology and being able to transfer communication and information. You know, somebody that you know sort of coordinates the group. Power and authority dynamics definitely exist. Um, you come into a group and you form, and there's lots of different sectors, lots of different perspectives, um, and within that you're going to have different power and authority dynamics. Oh, collaborative advantage is strategic. So we can get access to, to a variety of information when we collaborate. We can access resources. We can tap into you know, different networks. And so we're building um, you know, a better understanding of the, of the public policy challenges that we're trying to address. Recommendations to the FPT Food Safety Committee based on my discussions and, and, and the literature that I dove into is mapping governance. So really having a clear understanding of um, current governance structures and how communication is flowing, who's making decisions, what kind of decisions are being made, and also where are the gaps in governance that we need to address. Understanding stakeholders, so who should we be communicating with? Who should we be talking to? What are those opportunities that we can tap into? But also, what are the risks of not collaborating? What is the risk to public managers and to government if we don't get that you know, really critical information that we might get through collaboration? Um, again, how are we going to address power and authority structures? I mean, government has the power of legal statutes. Businesses have access to capital, and, and nonprofits can have you know, a large amount of support on issues that they represent. Institutional design, what is working um, to support that collaborative, eff collaborative effort? Um, do we need to adjust um, the institutional design that we're currently working within? What structures do we need to, to focus on? And facilitative leadership, so that really critical role of a neutral body coming in and ensuring that you know, decision making is, um, is equitable, that people have a purpose and they're involved, uh, that's a really key part. So the last slide here, strengths and challenges. So what does this mean for public health practice? Well, the strengths for sure is the knowledge transfer and information sharing we can access. Um, access to resources, uh, you know, particularly for organizations that might not have the, um, a lot of capacity, sharing power and authority. So instead of having power over, you know, giving power to and building people's um, organizations' capacity, making sure that we're, um, you know, Developing integrated decision making, and I think you know public health has such a role to play in so many areas. And if we can tap into you know different conversations and and get involved in, in different sectors, we can have such an impact. 
So challenges, organizational capacity, how are we going to collaborate, what are the resources we have access to, understanding the system context of all the stakeholders we're involved with. That can um, takes time and energy. You know, the public policies that we're, we're um, putting forward, how are they impacting other people? Um, challenges, weak collaborative infrastructure, and of course, access to resources. So that sort of sums it up, and huge thank you to Dr. Kevin Worthington for being the practicum supervisor, Caitlin Rowland, my, Tim Lambert, who is my practicum supervisor, and Betty coordinating, and yeah, the FPT Food Safety Committee, who's been fantastic in this initiative. Thank you, Brenda. Okay. <laughs> Questions? And as I walk the mic, I'm looking for a hand. I will say that the first time you showed me a draft of that, <laughs> the collab, I was like, oh, good what luck. Is, yeah, I know. <laughs> How are these people going to work together? And I, I took that and scaled it way down. <laughs> Thank you. That was so interesting to listen to. That's great. Um, one thing that really stood out to me, I was wondering if you could just touch on um, facilitated leadership. Right. That, yeah, yeah. I'd love to just. Yeah, I mean, I think that in the, in the four frameworks that I looked at, facilitative leadership was a big component of that. And so whether, you know, a facilitative leader emerges from the collaborative group, um, let's say we have, you know, Health Canada is involved in, in an initiative and they decide that they're going to facilitate, or maybe it's, you know, you bring someone in. But I think, you know, the key role of that individual is to understand um, sort of a bit of the background of those groups, understand, um, <laughs> you know, how they are going to ensure that there's equal participation among the members, you know, looking at decision-making strategies and tools and, you know, keeping the group on track and focused towards their goals and objectives. It's sort of that neutral body. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, under your recommendations, you had understand stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to elaborate a little bit? Like, how do you go about understanding stakeholders? And is that, does that include identifying who they are, or are they already identified, and then you just have to understand more about their goals and values? Yeah, or? I think it's... Um so there would be different approaches to understanding your stakeholders, and I think you know one way would be to just to to uh, you know reach out and communicate with them directly. Um, I think that you know within any issue there would be the obvious stakeholders, but I think the greater risk are, is when you're developing public policy, who are you not thinking about that might need to be considered, and um, you know just being mindful of of everyone that should be involved, you know the key players in discussions. Um, and I guess, you know, the, um, you know, understanding them would be, you know, how is this policy going to affect them? Um, in what ways is this going to be a positive or potentially harmful? Um, you know, how can we ensure that we're hearing their voices as well? What's, what's, what's the consultation going to, process going to look like? So it is a balanced approach. So. Thanks. Yeah. I actually hear a lot of echoes in your presentation from some of the key points that Charlotte was making this morning. Right. Right, in terms of collaborative yeah. relationships, power sharing, kind of having a clear idea of who's around the table and what their needs and perspectives are. Anyway. Exactly. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm trying to do a full room scan this time. I'm always missing somebody. Okay, well, if not, thank you very much, Thanks. Brett. That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs>